Hey y'all, welcome to Dear SQL DBA, a podcast for SQL Server database administrators and developers. I'm Kendra Little. This week's question sounds simple at first, but the answers for this can be kind of detailed. Here's the question. Dear SQL DBA, I see that heap tables are found in my database even when I know that those tables have a clustered index, but I see a lot of forwarded records on them. This happens to five tables in my database, and I can see the clustered indexes and in some cases the non-clustered indexes on the tables. Why are some scripts reporting them as heaps? Then they sent me this sample output from some of those scripts for the table showing that the table showed as having index ID zero and a bunch of forwarded records. This is something that puzzles a lot of people. And I've actually found this issue when looking at a lot of databases. The concepts in SQL Server around indexes and keys can be really confusing because we can overlap these concepts and, and we can have a primary key that's also a clustered index, but we don't have to. We could have a heap or you know we could have lots of different things in SQL Server. So first up, I'm going to talk through what are some of the, the different options that we have for disk-based tables in SQL Server, and then I'll talk through how I answered the question and figured out what was really going on uh, for the person who asked. I am just talking about disk-based tables today. In other words, I'm going to talk about traditional row store indexes in SQL Server, row store tables. In other words, just ordinary tables that you create in SQL Server that we've had for many years that store the data in B trees where the data is sorted according to a key if we define an index. And I'm also going to talk about column store indexes today, which are more recent things. They are also stored on disk and they use a columnar format that compresses thing at the, compresses data at the column level. And that's great for scanning those columns and doing big aggregations over the whole column or a partition of the table. But I'm not going to talk about Hecaton or in memory today, just because, you know, I know I would love to, but <laughs> only got a certain amount of time. So we'll leave the in memory slash Hecaton stuff for a future episode if somebody's got a question about that. So in terms of concepts around here, I think there's really, when we're thinking about indexes and keys on these disk based tables, there's really two concepts. And the first concept is how is the data physically ordered? When we create a clustered index on the table, when we look at the metadata for this, it's always going to have index ID equals one. Index ID one, when you're looking at the metadata for an index, it's a clustered index. If it's got index ID zero, it's not a clustered index. If it's got index ID greater than one, it is not a clustered index. It just always uses one for those. On a traditional B tree row store table, our classic table that we've been using for years, you can just choose one or more columns. And this is really powerful when you pick the clustering key because you're ordering the table itself on disk. It's not like you've got your table in one place and your clustered index in the other. When you create a clustered index on a B tree row store table, it is how the table itself is sorted on disk and the key columns that you choose determine the order of the data, how it's stored. Because everything is ordered by the key column you choose, that means that key is extremely powerful for queries. It's really easy for a SQL Server to look up and seek to a row or scan a set of rows based on your clustered index key. So that key value is really, really useful to make queries fast. And if the queries are pulling back a lot or using a lot of columns in the table, since the clustering key orders the table itself, it's got immediate access on a row store table to all the columns for that row. Really, really powerful is the clustering key. When you create a clustered column store index on the table, you're telling SQL Server, I want you to store every column in this table in that columnar format that is really great for scanning 
the whole column and doing things like aggregations on it. So when you create a column store index, you don't pick keys because you're saying, I want the whole table, every column to be stored in this columnar format. There's no magical, you know, lookup based on some columns because every, we're not row based anymore, right? We're column based. So we've got very different syntax to create these. And in the blog post that's associated with this episode, I've got example syntax to create everything that I'm talking about here today. If you're interested in the syntax, go to littlekendra.com and look for the post named index types, heaps, primary keys, and clustered and non-clustered indexes. You may want your clustered index on your row store table to also be a primary key. And you can totally do that. We can have one index that does double duty. And we're going to talk about that soon. It is on these row store tables. It is a best practice to make your clustered index unique, to keep it to be a relatively narrow size of bytes and to use columns where the values don't change a lot in order to make that index efficient and so that data isn't jumping around in your table like crazy. You can also create these indexes at the same time you create the table, or you can change them afterwards, of course, right? We can always go back in and change the clustered index on our table. We can even take a table that's currently a row store table with a row store clustered index, and we can change it and make it have a clustered column store index. We don't have to like create a different object and reload it. We can take an object and switch between row store and column store. And that can actually be a really good idea. This is kind of a side note, but there's a great article that Sunil Agarwal just recently published on the SQL Server Tiger Team blog. And he's talking about something called row group elimination in column store indexes. And he makes the point that there are some performance reasons if you're creating a new, a big table with a column store index, there are some performance reasons why you might want to create a row store clustered index to physically sort the rows, then get rid of that and put a clustered column store on it so it can leverage the data already sorted in a certain way. So read his post for the details. It's called Column Store Index Performance Row Group Elimination on the SQL Server Tiger Team blog. So even if you're going to use column store indexes, you need to know about row store indexes too. We also have the option to not create clustered index at all we can leave a table in what's called a heap. If you do not create a clustered index on a table, it will have index ID zero. In other words, when we're looking at the metadata for a table, you will never have a table that has both index ID zero and index ID one. It will have one or the other. It can't have both because the table can only be in one place on disk, right? We only have one copy of this table and you know, it, it sort of, it only exists in one dimension in the database. When you don't define a clustered index on a table and you have this heap, you've got a row store heap. It's not arranged in that big B tree anymore because we haven't given it uh, key columns to create this beautifully sorted B tree. But it, it does need a way to keep track of where it put every single row behind the scenes on all its pages. And it uses something called a RID or a row identifier behind the scenes to do this. You can't query a RID. You can see it if you run, you know, internal Z commands, but it's just what it uses behind the scenes to uniquely identify every row for you. And you can create non-clustered indexes on a heap. You can even partition a heap. You can create plain old row store non-clustered indexes. You can create column store non-clustered indexes, and you can create row store primary key non-clustered indexes as well. The second concept that we're talking about, right? So the first concept was, how is the data physically ordered on disk? We've got all these options. The second big concept to understand is, how do we uniquely identify a row for business purposes? And that second concept is the primary key. You don't have to have a primary key on a table. 
if you want a primary key, and many people do, because uniquely identifying a row for business purposes is pretty essential concept to making sure that every row is valid and that we don't have duplicate values for business purposes, right? If we do want to have a primary key, we can only have one per table. Now, you can also add other unique indexes or unique constraints. You can enforce all the uniqueness you want, but for business purposes, there is really, you know, there may be 60 ways to leave your lover, but there's only one way to have a primary key on a table, one per table at the most. Your primary key can be one or more columns. And often these days, most commonly when people design databases, what they use for primary keys in SQL Server is called a surrogate key. And, and when you create the primary key, you don't type surrogate key. All surrogate key it means is we created a column to uniquely identify the rows that it's usually an int or a big int or a unique identifier. It isn't, it isn't a natural thing that when you look at it, you know what it is. It's not, it's not like an order number that encodes the product name and the, you know, the manufacturer and all of that stuff. It isn't inherently meaningful to the business itself, but in our relational database, it uniquely identifies the row. So your, your primary key may be a surrogate key, which helps it to be narrower, right? Because if everything is natural keys, Sometimes we end up with really big, long keys in there. Another thing to know, a big thing to know about a primary key though is when you create a primary key in SQL Server, you create this as a constraint. The syntax is I am going to create a primary key constraint, but behind the scenes, what it's really doing is creating an index. Every primary key in SQL Server is also an index. And you can make this a clustered primary key if you choose. When you create a clustered primary key, you are saying this column or columns that is my business key, I would like you to also physically sort the table by these columns. Go ahead and combine the clustered index and the primary key and just do it with one index for me, please SQL Server. You can also create a non-clustered primary key. You can say, this is my business key that identifies every row. I don't want you to sort the table itself by it. Instead, I want you to create a separate non-clustered index structure. And this is always a row store B tree index, a classic index in SQL Server. And I want you to use that row store index to make sure that, you know, my business key is followed. And it can also be used for queries as well. You can create a non-clustered primary index on a, a heap, right? We don't have to have a clustered index on a table. We could have a table without a clustered index with a non-clustered primary key. We could have a table who has a clustered index and it also is the primary key. We could have a table with a clustered index and a non-clustered index primary key. We could have a clustered column store table with a non-clustered primary key. <laughs> so there's a lot of different combinations that we could have here on all sorts of different types of tables in SQL Server. And some of these, like uh, the non-clustered primary key index on the clustered column store table, that's SQL Server 2016 only. So when I'm talking about column store, a lot of the things I'm talking about today are in the most recent version of SQL Server and forward. We got a lot of cool features uh, coming out, well, that have already come out in there too. Now, one important anti-pattern to note, this often happens accidentally. Let's say I've got, you know, a customer's table and I've got a customer ID column. Sometimes what happens is people accidentally create a unique clustered index on customer ID, which physically, you know, orders the table by customer ID. And then they also create a non-clustered primary key on customer ID. This is technically an anti-pattern because we have two indexes where we could have just one. Why maintain two indexes? Every time we insert, update, and delete, we've got to put data in both and all sorts of reasons when we could just have 
one index doing the job of both. So if you're going to have a, if you want a cluster by a column that is all, or columns, that's also your primary key, you want to do a clustered primary key constraint that does the work of both. So what happened with our questioner? What's going on there? Well, I did some email back and forth and my guess was, based on the data they sent me, it's showing there's index ID zero. If you see index ID zero, it is a heap. It does not have a cluster, it does not have a clustered index on the table. And if you see forwarded records, that also only ever happens in heaps as well. So I said, my guess is this looks like these tables don't have a clustered index. I think what you're seeing is a non-clustered primary key. This probably happened either as a, you know an issue where the tables were around for a while and then someone said, oh, we need to add keys to these tables and they created them as non-clustered or just when the database was built, they were accidentally done that way as a, a syntax error in the T-SQL. And the questioner went and looked and confirmed and said, oh yes, you're right. They are non-clustered primary keys. I thought they were clustered, but in fact, they are not. Now, if this happens to you, often the next question is, well, what should I do? The, the right thing to do, <laughs> we're gonna talk about what's right, and then we're going to talk about what's practical. And, you know, sometimes those are the same thing. Ideally, you change from your non-clustered primary key to your to just a clustered primary key. When you've got this situation and you figure out that it was, in fact, you know, like, oops, you know, we didn't mean it to be this way. The problem is when you have a database where there's a lot of foreign key relationships or there's something like SQL Server replication, which cares deeply that you have a primary key on the table like it really cares it can be kind of a pain to drop a primary key and then create a new one if the tables are not a lot of gigs they're physically small and they aren't going to grow a lot and there's a relatively slow rate of inserts updates and deletes like you're not running a stock exchange here then practically speaking instead of doing the right thing and the right thing is absolutely changing to a cluster primary key. If you've just got a couple tables like this, you know, like I am, I am not going to shame you if you decide to create a unique clustered index on the table on the same column and you say going with duplicate indexes is the lesser evil here, right? So sometimes we pick the lesser evil. I am an advocate of <laughs> choosing the lesser weevil as I like to call it. And you know, like, you got to do what you got to do, but you know what the right thing is and, and make your make your choice wisely. Use the force wisely. In general, though, what which type? So we've got all these concepts in general. What should you do? What patterns are suited to which type of indexes? Generally, most tables that I run into have a clustered primary key. That is super duper common for the the column or columns that identifies, you know, the business rule that makes that a row unique. It is very, very common to also just have the whole table physically ordered by those columns and have a clustered primary key. Because that business, that's that business rule of how do I find a row is very often used in joins and the where clauses for querying that table, right? You often want to find rows, especially in an OLTP situation, you're often saying, hey, I just want to find one row to modify or look up. So especially in OLTP databases, this clustered primary key is by and far like what we find the most often. Now heap tables, tables that don't have a clustered index, they've got some baggage and they can behave really weird. They have sort of personality disorders, but they can still be useful. So we made mention of forwarded records earlier. Forwarded records can sometimes cause a performance problem. They're one of the little personality disorders of heaps. And generally we do want tables to have a clustered index because very often with tables, the majority of the time, we do want to either find a row or a set of rows in an OLTP type situation, or we want to scan whole columns and have a columnar structure in more of an analytics type of situation. But there are times where 
We just want to throw data into a pile and we're just going to scan the whole thing. We all, you know, we're going to like maybe load a cube up with it, or this is a staging table that's part of an ETL process. Sometimes the process of creating a clustered index on it before we read it again could slow down the whole thing that we're doing. And if we don't want to find ranges of rows or do something that a clustered index helps with, Having a heap can be faster. And actually scanning a heap, when you have a, a table that's a heap and you want to scan everything in it, SQL Server can sometimes do something called a physical allocation scan that's a little bit faster too. So heaps for like staging tables and ETLs or um, something like where you're always scanning a partition or the whole heap to load something can really make sense. There's also some tables where and this is an example of something like you've got a really specialized application and something like maybe a stock exchange or something else, although they may use in memory OLTP or something crazy now too, right? But a table where you're like, we have a very controlled set of queries that access this. Like we know what all these queries are and we're tuning them very highly and they don't always, you know, they, they get a known set of columns. Sometimes having a heap and tuning those queries very specifically with non-clustered indexes to make the lookups use the minimum number of logical reads possible, sometimes that can be effective. It's an edge case, but it's out there, right? Now, like I've been saying, we can also use this columnar storage. Column store indexes uh, in data warehouses a clustered column store index is more and more becoming a really natural pattern to have on a table because we often do want to scan the table, you know, scan certain columns or all of the columns and do aggregations on them. And that's really what, what column store is built to uh, really, really shine at. But there's also uses in OLTP databases now. Sometimes we have tables where we're doing inserts, updates, and deletes against these tables in a transactional environment, we need to do reporting on them right away. More and more, the business just business folks are like, we can't wait for an ETL to run. We can't wait till tomorrow to see this in a data warehouse. We can't wait for an hour to see this in a data warehouse. We need to give our customers immediate analytics on how things are running as soon as the data is in the database. SQL Server has created non-clustered column store indexes that are writable in SQL Server 2016. And the whole idea is that you can have, the, pat the pattern is you would have a traditional row store table in a B tree, which usually would have a clustered primary key on it. And that for the columns that you need to do analytics on them, you create a non-clustered column store index so that People can run aggregations on those columns. Inserts, updates, and deletes into the table can happen, and they use all sorts of magic. They actually use what's called a delta row store for changes coming into the table. And then, you know, so they're, they're actually using multiple types of structures behind the scenes. You don't have to code it. They already coded it. So the data can churn into a uh, row store format, and then it will stream them into the column store format behind the scenes really crazy new magic, and that is combining a row store clustered primary key with a writable non-clustered column store on top. They have also made it in SQL Server 2016 so that you can use snapshot isolation and read committed snapshot isolation and still access the column store index. And that means that it went with their other change, which is you can read that column store index on a readable availability group secondary. So the idea here would be that in your production database, you have you know, a row store table, probably with a clustered primary key, and you've got a non-clustered column store index on some of the columns. You let people query the non-clustered column store index, but for workload reasons, and because you only have so many CPUs and so many locks and you know all that stuff, maybe, you only let them read the clustered column store index over on an availability group secondary, or you only let 
most people read it over there and really important applications can read it on the production server itself. So you got lots and lots of options with this newfangled uh, or newfangled writable non-clustered column store indexes in SQL Server. There's also uh, things I'm, this is just kind of, I'm really, if you can't tell, I'm really excited about the column store stuff. They're also in 2016, we can do things like non-clustered row store primary key on the clustered column store itself. So we can mix and match things in, in a way that we, <laughs> in a way that we only dreamed of in the past. So the answer to this question gets longer and longer, right? Uh, on a related note, I have just recently acquired, in fact, like within the last week, a copy of Lewis Davidson's Pro SQL Server Relational Database Design and Implementation. This is the fifth edition. You can get it from APRESS. You can get it from Amazon. I like to use the smile.amazon.com. And this is not a sponsored mention in any ways. Um, Lewis is not sponsoring <laughs> Dear SQL DBA. He's a great fellow though. And this is a fantastic book. If you're interested in how do I implement the right keys and the right indexes in SQL Server and you know how do I do database design, you really want Lewis Davidson's book on this and the SQL Server 2016 updated version is now out. So check that out. I'm really happy to have my copy and I am really looking forward to reading it more. It is, it is a great book. So thank you so much for joining me this week for Dear SQL DBA. It is always a special day when I get to talk about indexes. I'm Kendra Little and I'll see you again soon.